This week on Life and Faith. Nothing that we had done had made any meaningful difference for these people. Now the Taliban were back in control of that country. At four o'clock this morning, she woke me up to tell me that the Queen had died. Some people are very inspired by religious conviction. Contempt is profoundly different from disagreement. It feels like my spine has been restored. Welcome to Life and Faith from CPX. I'm Simon Smart. And I'm Justine Toe. And today we are delving into a topic that's really important and also difficult, Justine. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be speaking with the last Australian Defence Force chaplain to leave Afghanistan in 2020. Now, he was there for the final withdrawal of Australian forces after 20 years of ADF presence there. And we're going to hear about that experience. And we're doing that in relation to the subject of moral injury. Now, we hear all the time about the terrible toll on veterans of combat situations and PTSD, that kind of thing. But this is another element to this. Yeah, it certainly expanded my thinking. I guess we're more used to thinking of the physical toll of traumatic situations. But this term, moral injury, is doing something a bit different from that, it seems. It speaks to how uh, these experiences damage people at a moral or ethical level, which sounds kind of abstract, but if you can think of it somehow as it damages them spiritually. It harms their sense of who they are and who they are in the world. And it's something that's really difficult to heal from, therefore. I think uh, some of the literature talks about being soul sick, which yeah. I think is really evocative, but kind of gets at the sense. You and know. speaking of which, I mean, just you know, last night before you know, we're going to record this today, you told me that you were randomly came across a television program that speaks right to this. I know. It was really strange. Like, I don't watch ABC in the evening normally because I'm <laughs> Netflixing, right? <Okay. laughs> but I happened to find myself in front of Australian Story. And just because of these random references, I heard to uh, the news company Reuters and I saw this blonde lady. Yeah, a long time ago as an, as an intern. And I saw this blonde lady who I picked up. Her name was Mary. And I thought, could this be Mary Binks, who for a while worked in the Sydney newsroom? And so she's married to uh, a guy called Dean Yates, and he was the subject of this Australian story, story. And he was at one point the Iraq bureau chief of Reuters, and he had some local news journalists, some camera people and a photographer, and two of these guys ended up getting killed by the US forces. And he... Yeah, in what kind of circumstance? Though? Oh, my gosh. So it's like they were showing us vision of some kind of, um, you know, like looking through the crosshairs, basically. And um, these people, like, they're just walking along. They're, they're distant figures, very anonymous. And one of the guys is carrying his camera. But then the soldiers, you can hear their commentary. They're seeing it as a missile or some kind Dangerous. of weapons. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So they ended up shooting them. Mm. And it was such a terrible, terrible incident. And it seems as though the military had not shown the full context of the video, which actually um, very much underlined their innocence or their, you know, that yeah. they shouldn't have, this shouldn't have happened. Anyway, to cut a long story short, Dean was so traumatized from this experience. He wasn't at fault. He did not pull the trigger, but he was harmed by the experience of being part of a system where these people in his employ, in his care. Yeah, so he felt responsible for he the, did. the two men who were killed. Yeah, that's right. And it was just the language that really struck me because he was saying over and over again, how can I atone for this? Mm -hmm. Now, I know nothing about Dean and his backstory. If like, I don't know if there's any religion in his life, but this is language that's freighted like, very much with that. The mm -hmm. whole episode of this, Australian story is actually called atonement, mm. and so you, he's seeking atonement. He's for seeking this atonement. Feeling, this yeah. yeah. So he was going to get PTSD from some sort of psychiatric kind of treatment place, and then this idea of moral injury comes up, and it gets to the place where he's saying, "I I want forgiveness. I need forgiveness," and it gets to the point where the pastoral care worker is performing some kind of ritual with him, where he would hold his hands over a basin, and she would pour water on them. And he says that he felt an incredible release at that moment. Gosh. So given that we were going to mm. record this day, I was like, Crazy. oh. Here was this moment of, <laughs> and, and he's seeking some sort of a relief at a, it is at a spiritual level, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, timely for what we're going to talk about today. Yes. 
But of course, we are talking about it in a slightly different adjacent context. We're hearing from Sam Gregory, uh, the last ADF chaplain in Afghanistan. But we're also going to hear from a medical doctor and ethicist who's thought about moral injury, especially in relation to medical professionals who've suffered through the experiences of the pandemic. Yes, and we'll get to that shortly. But first up is a conversation I had with Sam Gregory. Sam joined the Defence Force when he was 18 years old, right after the September 11 attacks and Australia heading off to Afghanistan. He trained at the Royal Military College in Canberra and became a signals officer. He was in the army for 20 years and three times, Justine, he was told he would deploy to Afghanistan and get ready for that. Mm. Three times that didn't happen. So that's an interesting story in itself. But eventually he does go to Afghanistan right at the end of the campaign. But by now he's a chaplain. So he goes as a chaplain for that final withdrawal. It was very close to all the chaos that we all recognise that was the end of the coalition forces being in that country. So Sam spoke with me from his home in Canberra, and we began by talking about the nature of the work he was doing there. So I arrived the day that they decommissioned the chapel uh, without telling the chaplain that was there that they were doing it. And so there was this sense in which, what are we doing here? Like, this place is shutting down. I don't even have a chapel to run. I would later, with uh, a UK chaplain, uh, start running chapel services in the departure lounge at the airport, which was basically a big coalition military base. Mm. I would do visits to uh, locations where we had smaller numbers of people uh, in the sort of diplomatic zone, different parts of Kabul. I would walk around and talk to people who were mainly busy with the task of shutting down operations and bringing everything home safely, people and equipment. Uh, and I was sending things of significance back to the war memorial so that we could keep records of how we conducted operations in that place. But really, I think, critically analysing what had our contribution over 20 years been to that country Um, Mm. and having those kind of conversations with our people and our partners, people like the Dutch and the Americans who were over there with us, uh, who were all, I think, sensing this, well, the end was very, very close to us. um, And there were questions about what had we achieved in 20 years. What was your sense? You you came in right at the end, but what was the feeling for you about that very question? What had we achieved? I think the sense was we weren't done yet and that we were being constrained by political forces to bring about the end of that operation, that those who were there would say, we're we're not finished, we've still got work to do here. But there was a very clear timeline. Like I said, I left when we had to have 70 people or less there and that's why I left the country. There's this timeline in place that meant we had to be out of there. And yet the Taliban, who were committing to this process of a negotiation to bring us down to having no forces in that country, were also very clearly wanting that situation to come about. They knew it was advantageous for them that the coalition would leave and that would allow them to conduct the operations that they wanted to to secure that country back um, from the National Army and from the government of Afghanistan. So you're working with um, a lot of... ADF personnel. Tell us about the Afghani people that you had contact with. They were the main source of us understanding that these people aren't really ready for us to leave them, that they are going to suffer when we are gone because they depend upon us, uh, not just for the financial and material support that we provide, but for the practical advice and support and encouragement that we are to them when they're here. Um, We weren't involved in combat operations realistically anymore like the the Taliban were avoiding targeting western forces because if they did attack us that would bring an end to those discussions that they were having with the US about leaving the country but we were well aware that the casualty rates were still as high as they'd ever been that people were still being killed on a daily basis they were just members of the Afghan National Army rather than members of the larger military force that was situated in Afghanistan. I'm very interested in the feeling among the people as you know, by the time you arrive, it's very clear that the forces, the coalition forces are pulling out. Yep. Was there a sense of dread for people there? The discussion was when, not if, the Afghan National Army would fail to protect themselves from the Taliban. It was, it was not a consideration that they were going to be able to withstand the assaults that were coming their way. It was a question of how long might they be able to stay in control of their country. And the estimates were sort of six to 18 months. Uh, The fact that it was instantaneous, essentially, had not been considered in the conversations I was having with people. 
But the type of conversations I were was happening, the first day I arrived, conversations with our medical team that were on the ground there um, who were involved in, you know, that trauma response. Uh, someone arrives on a helicopter, they've been involved in an incident, they've got to save their life. And they had the skill and they had the technology and the equipment to save a life that had been involved in combat trauma. They would then have this awful realisation that after a day or two stabilising that person with the medical care that they needed, they would then hand them over to the local authorities and they would ask for an ambulance to come to the gate to meet them and uh, you know, a panel van would turn up, like a, a van would turn up. There'd be a stretcher in the back, but it's not an ambulance, Simon. It, it has no life support capabilities. And as soon as they hand that person over, they're not even going to make it to the hospital at the other end. They're not going to... So it would have been better for our people in many ways to say, don't bring the ambulance, which we know isn't an ambulance. Bring the family so they can say goodbye. Um, and when we're gone, what support are they going to get at all? Like they do not have the ability to look after their people that are involved in combat and are getting injured uh, the way that we can. So those are incidences where we were putting Australians in awful situations where this was not what they thought they were there to do. This is not the training they'd been given about how we were supporting the Afghan people. There must have been a, a sense of, and it'd be very hard for people who haven't had this experience to understand the, the level of it, but who've committed so much in this time and whatever you think of the rights or wrongs of that, but this huge commitment and then to see it sort of fall away so quickly and to have that sense of it happening, you know, the inevitability of that, that must be deeply frustrating for you, but also many of the people you've worked with. Absolutely. Most of the conversations I was having after it was official that Afghanistan had fallen were, were almost nostalgic. It was like, okay, but if we think about what we were doing in 2006, or we think about what we were doing in 2012, that was good work, Sam. That was, you know, we made a difference then. And there was almost this need to, for self-protection, not to dwell on what was happening in 2021 as Afghanistan was falling, because it did invalidate everything we'd done over 20 years, because there was no escape in the reality that nothing that we had done had made any meaningful difference for this people now uh, that the Taliban were back in control of that country. And, and these were our allies. They asked us to come to support them and their attempts at democracy and their desires to govern themselves. And they were our partners. They were our friends. We weren't an invading force. We were there by invitation. And we had wanted to make a better Afghanistan with them. And the brutal reality was it wasn't going to be a better Afghanistan. Being back home and then seeing it so quickly uh, fall to the Taliban and all those dreadful scenes of people desperately trying yeah. to get to the airport and then even to the extent of people clinging onto planes and things. It's one thing for me to see that. For you, it must be a very traumatic thing to watch. Yeah, I couldn't disassociate. Like they, That was the place I had been. That had been the place I had worked at. That airfield was my home for seven weeks, but it was my experience of Afghanistan and for it to be the epicentre of what was going on with our evacuation efforts and seeing footage of that place and going, oh yeah, I know where that is. I know what part of the base that is. And watching desperate parents throw babies over fences in some hope of getting them out of there was just awful. Mm. Um, you know, we put them in that situation when we when we left because we were no longer there to help them. And of course, there will be arguments that we couldn't stay forever. But while we stayed, those things weren't going to happen. And it was only once we left that they were going to happen. That's Chaplain Sam Gregory, and we're coming back to him later. But first, we're going to take a detour, Justine. Yes. Andrew Sloan, one of the CPX fellows who does work with us here, is a former medical practitioner, and he's now an ethicist and lecturer in Christian thought at Morling College in Sydney. And he has this great piece in ABC Religion and Ethics where he talks about COVID-19's health workers and moral injury. So as you'll hear, Sam's story is going to verge into that territory shortly, exploring how moral injury relates to his own experience in the military, uh, which Andrew told me is the first context in which this concept emerged. Mm. But we did want to talk to Andrew to set the scene for us. So first, what is moral injury? So it's when somebody has either done or witnessed something which is in deep conflict with their internalised moral values and it leaves them damaged, damaged psychologically, damaged emotionally, damaged ethically, damaged spiritually. So the way I think of it is 
a disruption to someone's understanding of themselves. People enter professions like the military or medicine or other things because they want to do something which, which matters in the world and which they see as a good in the world. And when they either do something or see something which is completely contrary to why they entered this thing in the first place, then their understanding of who they are and who they are in the world is fractured. So I think it's primarily a, a matter of wounded identity and a wounded sense of what the world is meant to be and who they're meant to be in it. There's also a part that jobs can play in that as well, right? Or your sense of what your job was or mm. your sense of the institution that you're part of. Um, I mean, for example, people in the military are subject to policies set by the Defence Force, not even them really, like the governments, for example. Mm. The individual is subject to all these forces beyond their control and that has tangible harms right. on them if it goes wrong. Very much so. In the literature on moral injury, there's a distinction being now drawn between what's called moral injury, self and moral injury other. Moral injury other is when it's institutions or someone else whose actions, orders, requirements, constraints mean that someone either sees something that is inconsistent with their moral framework or they are required to do something which is inconsistent with their moral framework. They're forced to leave an injured civilian behind, even though their normal response would be to go and rescue them because the rules of deployment don't allow it. Or they have to fire on someone that they're not sure is armed or not because they're not stopping at a checkpoint. The rules of deployment require it of them. So that's something that happens that impinges on them from the outside, but again, damages them morally. Is moral here in a strange way, is it another word for spiritual? Because we're not talking about physical wounds that you can see, but we're sure. trying to get at some kind of harm or wrong done to some person, but not, not that you can see it. The way the literature has discussed it is primarily spoken in ethical categories. Uh, now, some of the literature is alert to, I guess, the religious and spiritual component, but a lot of it's not even though one of the definitions of people with moral injury is that they're people with wounded souls. Do you think moral injury is something that is hard to get people to take seriously? Mm. Like it's, it seems like a very, I don't know, it just seems a little bit ethereal in a way, like it's hard yeah. to pin down. In some ways it is, but it's something that now people in the military are taking very, very seriously indeed, simply because of the way it has influenced veterans on their return. So we're all aware of the consequences of trauma, so PTSD, the ways that that interferes with people's ability to return to normal social life when they come back from deployment, the way it interferes with their relationships. Well, one of the things that people discovered was that there were dimensions of that disruption which weren't accounted for by a response just to trauma. PTSD results from when someone experiences a threat which is overwhelming, which their normal responses aren't able to cope with. But it's primarily about violence. There's some power that was exerted, and it's that overwhelming physical sense of threat. Moral injury occurs when, if you like, the threat is not a physical threat to personal integrity, but a moral threat to personal integrity. And that leaves different kinds of wounds and one of the ways we can distinguish between them is because those programs which do work in response to PTSD, and there, there are some, don't help with moral injury. And so what we've seen with a lot of veterans is just how damaged they have been by the things that they've done or the things that they have seen, which conflicts with who they understand themselves to be as military personnel. And so it's something that is now being taken quite seriously and increasingly taking it seriously in other contexts as well. You're listening to Life and Faith and we're hearing ethicist Andrew Sloan talk about moral injury, the real harm someone experiences when forced to act in a way that violates their deeply held values and beliefs. And we've had a glimpse of what moral injury looks like in a military context. But Andrew has also explored how it applies to the experience of health workers during the pandemic. Health workers are reasonably familiar with making hard choices. That's kind of part of the gig, because there are times when we know that 
there's nothing that we can do that's going to be able to fix the problem that someone's presented with. And have to make decisions between options. And very often it's the least worst option that you need to choose. So those hard decisions are not unfamiliar. But COVID resulted in a whole lot of forced hard decisions that were very unfamiliar to most health practitioners. So there are some circumstances where people are required to make distribution of resources decisions in an intensive care unit, for example. There are only a certain number of beds. If they're fully occupied and someone comes in who might be able to use it, they can't use it. But during the pandemic, if you like, ordinary bods had to make those decisions, particularly in places like Italy or India, the number of people who could benefit from ventilation were enormous and the number of ventilated beds was very small. And so people were turned away who would normally be treated by ventilation. So they'd have a tube down their throat and a machine helping them breathe in order for them to survive. They were turned away knowing that there was a good chance that if they had that done for them, they would live, knowing that if it's not, they will die. That's not a decision that most healthcare workers generally have to make. So there were these forced decisions life and death decisions. But there are also other forced decisions, um, not so much life and death, but deeply impacted people's experience as healthcare workers. So most of us are familiar with the discomfort of wearing a mask. In the height of the pandemic, people who are in clinical situations had to wear full personal protective equipment, which meant these nasty suits, uh, stuff all over their head, big masks, face shields, gloves, and one of the things about healthcare, doctors, nurses, physios, whomever, is touch. Touch is really important to what people do, why they got into this business in the first place. Wearing PPE, you cannot touch the people you're caring for. That actually distorts the relationship. People can't see your face. That means they can't interact with you the way they normally would, nor can you interact with them. My, my wife was a nurse during the pandemic and a few weeks in, she came home really puzzled why her forehead was sore. And she realized that because she was wearing a mask, the only facial expression people could see were her eyebrows. And mm. so her eyebrows were working triple time and <laughs> it just meant that the muscles were sore. Weird, hey? So mm. there's some kind of expected things if you think about it, and then some really unexpected things. Things also in aged care and palliative care. This is an area which is generally neglected in our social conversations anyway. But in the pandemic, all we really heard about were nursing home deaths. We didn't hear about the way that people's lives in nursing homes are deeply disrupted. People who are dealing with ongoing effects of dementia, for example, are confused enough as it is and seeing mm. this weird alien being walk in in what seems to them like a diving suit, not being able to see their face, not being able to feel their touch, was deeply distressing for them and, of course, for the families who were no longer able to visit them. All of these things meant that healthcare workers weren't able to do the things that they would normally rightly expect to do but they couldn't do it. And they saw mm. the damage that that did, the ways in which people were actively harmed by some of the stuff they were required to do, and the ways in which people weren't helped and often suffered quite significantly as a result of the things that they weren't able to do. So we'll leave it there with Andrew Sloan. But for now, back to Sam Gregory and his own experience of moral injury. So when I returned to Australia, one of the things that was going on at the time was that we were training our chaplains in moral injury intervention method called pastoral narrative disclosure. And so I was undergoing that training. And uh, the thing that it made me realize was that I was experiencing these symptoms of shame in relation to Afghanistan. And, and my reactions would suggest that I had a moral injury myself. And so that um, training almost became therapeutic in some sense for, for me as I went, all right, well, what does this process say I should be doing about this potential morally injurious event that I've experienced. And what it says is basically you should be talking to people about it. And so I didn't do what often uh, soldiers and veterans think is going to be the best answer, which is just to hide it and internalise it. I said I couldn't be a chaplain who was telling people, you need to go get help, you need to speak to someone about your situation and not take my own medicine, right? Yeah. So I would open up and I would share these feelings of profound shame about our involvement in Afghanistan over 20 years and 
the difficulty in what I was experiencing because I felt that as an organisation, we were responsible for their suffering now. We were responsible for what they were going through. And that was really hard because the reaction I got uh, from people that I trusted that I was sharing uh, these feelings with was not positive. Um, They would be quite judgmental about um, those ideas. Um, They would ask me whether I thought it was helpful um, that our soldiers were hearing those sort of ideas from their chaplain. They thought that if I was wrestling with whether or not I stayed serving in the army, that implied that they should think about getting out of the army. And so I found that in the midst of this community that was being taught about moral injury, I was someone with a potential moral injury and they weren't able to help me. Mm. Um, Other people were starting to identify it, people like my wife, uh, people that I was interacting with were going, there's more going on here for you than just uh, just the fall of Afghanistan. This, this is your reactions are significant. Have you thought about the possibility that you got a moral injury? And I would say yes, I have. And I don't know where to go to get help. Um, and that was that was hard. Yeah. Because you're a chaplain, and because of your Christian faith, I'm imagining you have both something to offer people in relation to moral injury, but also something you have to think about for yourself, having experienced it. And I wonder to what extent that's your faith's been helpful to you in this. Um, so it was probably another year that had gone by after the fall um, of Afghanistan and I'd made that decision to get out of the military, but I was doing it slowly and I went through some more training. And what's really helpful about this training was it, it showed me the connection between uh, military training itself and uh, moral injury. And there's a, a man in Canberra, by the name of Ned Dobos, who's written on this in a book called Ethics, Security and the War Machine. And he is of the opinion that the conditioning we do of our soldiers is necessarily morally injuring. And it's because the training that we give is dehumanizing. It essentially allows our soldiers to do their job by ensuring that the people that they are requiring to kill are not seen as as human beings. And one army officer described the tension that this puts a chaplain in, in particular, when he was he was talking with his chaplain. He said, your job is almost hypocritical, Padre, because I'm here to make killers out of people and you're here to make them feel good about it. Um, and there is a real tension in that, like that it's almost this this cruel kindness to our people that we help them to not see combatants, enemy combatants as human beings, because that is less devastating on them than if they were uh, killing human beings. But the consequence of that in Afghanistan uh, was that they almost did that potentially indiscriminately. Uh, This came home to me during the evacuation attempts. I was in lessons with uh, some of our soldiers about ethics uh, and, you know, the profession of war. And the day before, there had been the bomb at the front gate. And they were all very upset about this. Understandably, I was. And my question for them was how many people were killed? And very confidently, they would respond, 13 people were killed, Padre. And the reality, Simon, is 13 US troops were killed and 169 Afghan civilians were killed. And in their view, the US troops are people and the Afghan civilians are not people. And that's part of that dehumanizing process that we are subjecting them to. But it conditioned them to not see the Afghan people as people. And and so that contributed to, well, the moral injury that I was experiencing because I, I'm part of this problem. I have made Australians view our friends in Afghanistan not as human beings. And I'm a hypocrite, like that army officer suggests, because I don't know how to undo that. And the reality is we do not undo that. There is no point at the end of a soldier's career that we deprogram them from that, that we undo the dehumanizing process. And this is uh, this is Ned Dobos's fear that a lot of the issues we have with the veteran community is that we do not care about them enough. We care about them enough at the time. That cruel kindness of, of dehumanizing them at the time, we don't care about enough at the end to put the humanity back in them. Mm. Um, as a Christian... That is really confronting because, you know, my faith tells me that every human is made in the image of God and therefore worthy of dignity and respect and value. And then I'm part of an organization that has taken that dignity and respect away from a whole nation of people and not given it back to them at any point. 
And so I think like a lot of other chaplains, you you come away with this unescapable reality of the, in, in Christian faith, we call it the depravity of man, um, th- this idea that we are all broken and fallen, um, but that the only hope that we have is the hope of the gospel, the hope that God can uh, put us back together again, lift us up again, um, and that, that depravity needs to be dealt with. It's been a very difficult few years for the ADF. The Brereton Inquiry unearthed a whole lot of war crimes committed by Australian soldiers. What's your sense among ADF personnel in terms of how they view these challenges? Is it destabilising for them? Um, for me, it is, um, because as an army, we collectively own the honour of our institution. Like when one person does something to make us look good, collectively we look good. That's how an army works. And when one person does something to make us not look good, we collectively own that as well. The fact that it happened in the special forces community does, I think, allow the army to some extent, and particularly the Air Force and the Navy, to feel a distance from that. Mm. But I wouldn't want to let us all off that easily. I, I would want to say we we own that collectively together. We asked the special forces to do dangerous tasks on our behalf because they were better trained and equipped to do that. And they took those risks and that saved the lives of other servicemen because they were not put in those dangerous situations. And so if we were happy to let that happen, we should also expect that with the potential implications of being discredited um, in some of the things that they did, we should collectively own that. Um, Not everyone would agree with me on that. uh, And that's okay. But that's where I land on these things. And finally, it sounds to me like this topic we're talking about in terms of moral injury is of such a nature that as good as you know, psychology can be and cognitive behavioral therapy and these sorts of things are important and helpful in certain contexts, my sense is it's not enough for what you're talking about. Would you agree with that? And if so, what, what is required? Yeah, uh, the awareness of the existence of moral injuries came about because psychiatrists like Jonathan Shea and and psychologists and others were aware that the standard treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder weren't working on people. And the realisation came that what does seem to work is the stories that people tell. And that makes sense to us. We, We are in an institution that tells stories about who we are. Uh, We are the Anzacs. Uh, we are the Jonathan Churches with an injured Rwandan girl in his arms uh, carrying her to safety. We we are the good guys. We are on the side of right. If the Australians are there, it must be okay um, because they wouldn't be there for any other reason. And so when our ability to tell those stories becomes compromised, when our ability to be truthfully uh, or be truthful at all about um, what we have done is limited, then of course people are going to struggle the way that you are seeing I'm struggling. So we need better stories, we need more encompassing stories, stories like the story we find in the Bible that is able to accept the depravity of man, is able to accept our brokenness and still have a hope in the future uh, for us. And so that's what the ADF needs. Uh, it needs a story of hope in the future. It really wants, I think, an offer of redemption. It wants to be able to do something to redeem itself that's a really difficult thing for a military to do. I don't know if there's anything it can do to redeem itself um, because of the way a military works. But the Christian story offers redemption where it is not us that does the thing that is needed to redeem ourselves. It's a story where God does the thing that is necessary to redeem us. Um, So maybe that is the story that the Defence Force needs. It's certainly the story I need. You've been listening to Life and Faith with me, Simon Smart, and Justine Toe. Thanks to Sam Gregory, Andrew Sloan, and our friend Matt Andrews for putting us onto this story as well. You can look out for Andrew's piece on COVID-19 and moral injury. I will put it on the show notes. Thank you also to our producer, Alan Dalthwaite. Now, if you've gotten something out of this episode or there's someone you think would enjoy it, please do share it with them. You can also support the work of CPX or Life and Faith in particular by subscribing to the show and leaving us a review. It helps it get out to more people. 
Now, before we go, I should mention that CPX has been hosting the annual Richard Johnson Lecture in Australia here for almost 10 years. And this year, clinical psychologist Lisa Aitken will be speaking on the topic, Rediscovering Hope, How We Lost It, How We Get It Back. Now, this public event will be in Perth, October 26, and Sydney on November the 1st. So for more information and to get your tickets, go to publicchristianity.org. One last thing. Life and Faith is taking a break for a few weeks so we can research some new stories. But we'll be back. Till next time on Life and Faith.